Hello my friends. Welcome to my channel, Lindy's Magpie Reads. If you're new here, special welcome to you. I'm Lindy. I read a lot. I'm going to tell you about six books today, uh, five that I finished, one that I did not, that I abandoned. And before I get to the books, I'm going to start with a few things that have been happening this past week. It's been a bit busy. First off, it was my birthday yesterday. Quiet celebration. My sister is in town just by chance because her granddaughter, my great niece, had some surgery scheduled in Edmonton. Uh, something that they didn't do up in Whitehorse where they're from. So that all went well on Tuesday and they've been uh, staying with me since then. My great niece is recovering very well. So all, all is good. My sister Simon is a champion berry picker. She picked a quart of Saskatoons for me and I made a berry crisp. I've made a second berry crisp since then with black currants and raspberries from the farmer's market. And now I've got lots of raspberries becoming ripe in my own garden. So berries, berries, berries and more berries and my favorite fruit of the summer, berries of every kind. Okay, on to the books. So, first off, the one that I didn't finish, it's not because it's not a good book, but it's because I was in the wrong format. I was listening to the audio edition of The Story of Art Without Men by Katie Hessel. It's an 11 hour audiobook and I got through half of it before I decided I need to see the illustrations. And because I was so busy and out and about and doing things, it wasn't easy to just stop the audio, look up the artist. Only half of the women mentioned in there are artists. I was familiar with their names, so even knowing what the spelling would be. So I've also got the print edition on hold at the library, and I'm just going to wait for that and I think it'll be way more enjoyable. I saw that there's 100 full color illustrations in the print book and it'll just be so much better to hear talking about art with the pictures there. Now, there is only a, usually quite a short bit of information about each artist that Hessel is talking about, so I often want to know more and want to look it up online. So I'll be able to do that much more easily with the print book in front of me. So out of the next five books, none of them are five star reads, but I will save my two favorites till the end. Probably the most disappointing is this next one. I did give it three stars, so that's still enough to recommend it. It's a memoir called Thinning Blood a memoir of family, myth, and identity. It's by Leah Myers, and I listened to the audiobook read by Kimberly Woods. Myers is one-eighth Indigenous, so she is a member of the Jamestown Sklalem tribe in the Pacific Northwest. That tribe has a one-eighth blood quantum minimum so she is the last in her family unless she marries somebody who's also from that tribe she's the last person who can be a member and in her family line the Jamestown Sklalem tribe has only 542 members and she says 297 of them are one-eighth Sklalem so eventually, unless they change the blood quantum rules, there won't be any left. This is a memoir about having mixed ethnicity. Where Leah grew up, people did not believe that she was indigenous. Uh, kids said they don't exist, Indians don't exist anymore. Uh, even her friends, as she got into adulthood, didn't believe her and would say, it's okay to be Mexican, you know, we're all right with it. You don't have to say you're indigenous. 
So one of the things she talks about is the legacy of the American photographer Edward Curtis who wanted to capture Indian life before it disappeared forever and his work would later go on to be dramatized by Marie Clements. I found this out in Meyer's memoir and Marie Clements is the uh, film director that I mentioned a few weeks ago. The film that I saw Bones of Crows, she was a director for that. This other film that Myers is talking about is The Edward Curtis Project, a modern picture story, a play, and it was also produced as a book with photographs by Rita Leistner. It's about the trauma that the notion of a vanishing race has inflicted on Indigenous peoples. So this stereotype of Native Americans dying out can be traced back to Edward Curtis. But at the same time, as Myers is saying in, in what I've just told you, there are fewer and fewer people who can call themselves Sklawan. Uh-oh. Squirrels. Dog. <laughs> Hazards of filming outside. So there is a lot of things that I admire about this memoir, including the way she talks about contemporary issues like missing and murdered Indigenous women. Uh, she says, and Native women are murdered at a rate 10 times the rate of other Americans. The rate is even higher in Canada. She says more than 80% of Native women report that they've been assaulted at some time in their life. She also writes about the forced sterilization of Native women in the States. Uh, one in four Native women over the course of a decade. So this is women between the ages of 15 and 44 in the 1970s. 25% of them had forced sterilization. And this is something that happened in Canada as well. I don't know the rates, however. Myers mentions that her grandmother and her siblings were the first Indigenous children in the Port Angeles school system and that they were always bullied and beaten by the other kids and when their mother, Meyer's great-grandmother, approached the principal about this problem, his solution was to let them out of class 15 minutes early so they could run home ahead of the bullies. She talks about her complicated relationship with Disney's Pocahontas movie. When she was growing up, it was the only representation of an Indigenous girl that she saw in popular culture. And so she loved that movie. But as an adult now, when she looks at it, I think she said the most recent time where she watched it, she counted. Uh, the word savage is used 46 times and there are other derogatory and demeaning terms that are used. For example, dirty shrieking devils, 24 times. Now, there were some aspects of this book that I found pretty annoying, including her stated claim of how smitten she was with the Sklalem language and um, how she wants desperately to understand it and yet didn't take advantage uh, uh, as of the time when she was writing the memoir anyway didn't take advantage of uh, language classes that she had access to but she does talk about how fear and feeling inadequate and not Indian enough is what has prevented her to this date anyway from doing that or learning how to bead, learning how to pull a canoe, 
that sort of thing, cultural, cultural stuff. So all in all, the memoir is okay, and there aren't a lot of memoirs that specifically address that unique situation of being of mixed heritage and how do you figure out your identity when you don't have a lot of access to culture. A what? No. No. This next audiobook, Eat and Flourish, How Food Supports Emotional Well-Being, it's by Mary Beth Albright. It's read by Carolyn Schaffer. I don't have to say much about this. Uh, a lot of the information was just there to remind me about eating a good diet and how it affects emotional, our emotional health. The four things to pay attention to are your microbiome, inflammation, nutrients, and pleasure. I like the way that Albright talks about current research. So for example, the same food, if it's colored red, tastes sweeter and the same food on a different shape and color of plate tastes different. So those kinds of aspects of food and mood are just interesting kinds of things. The overall recommendations are to eat five cups of produce every day and eat at least one fermented food every day. Eat whole grains whenever you choose to eat grains, beans, legumes, and nuts at least once a day. To cook, choose, or prepare ingredients yourself once a day and to eat with another person once a day. And that's the way to flourish. Next up is uh, a youth nonfiction about an African-American sculptor, Augusta Savage. It is subtitled, The Shape of a Sculptor's Life. It's written by Marilyn Nelson. Augusta Savage was arguably the foremost American sculptor in the 1930s. She was born in 1892. She died in 1962 in relative obscurity. One of the sculptures that she's famous for, what she was commissioned to create for the World's Fair in 1939, it's called the Harp. She says, I've taken for my theme the National Negro Anthem. It lift every voice and sing. And what Marilyn Nelson has done in telling this story is used a series of poems. So this is a narrative in verse and often the verse has a shape on the page. So in this case, you can see the shape of the harp, the sculpture. And there were so many tragic things that happened in Augusta Savage's life it just seemed like one disaster after another, including the fact that at the end of the World's Fair, she was unable to raise the funds to have the harp moved and stored. So it was made out of plaster and painted to look like black basalt, but she didn't have the funds to store it or to get it cast in bronze and uh, there was a, a couple of places, I think that Fisk University and an insurance company that both were interested in acquiring the sculpture, but they didn't raise funds in time. And so it just ended up being destroyed. And then she had um, a whole bunch of her other work that was sent to a gallery and in transit, it was lost, never to be found again. So things like that happened to her. And of course the racism that she faced every day but she was thriving during the Harlem Renaissance she uh, operated a school uh, 
an, an art school and uh, I had never heard of her before so I was really glad that I picked up this biography. Next up is another audiobook, Big Swiss by Jen Began. Now this one has got a full cast of narrators so the audiobook production is excellent. It's about an audio transcriber and her job is to transcribe the therapy sessions that a sex therapist has and it's in a fairly small town in upper state New York. A lot of rich people there uh, and she recognizes the voice of one of the women who goes for therapy. She's been calling her Big Swiss but when she meets her they start having an affair. So both women are bisexual and both have a lot of trauma in their past. So there's serious undertones, even though the tone of the novel is quite humorous. And the this, this stuff that happens is just bizarre. It's uh, hard to believe, but very entertaining. And to give you an example of the style of writing, I'll just read this little passage that I transcribed myself. Rather than knock, Greta merely stared at the front door, which appeared to be made of solid chestnut, containing many evocative knocks. Big Swiss abruptly opened the door and pulled Greta into the foyer. She was flushed, dressed entirely in pink, and seen to be glowing from within. Greta felt like she was being greeted by a Himalayan salt lamp. I quite like this. Four stars. And last up, my favorite book of the week is one that I spent more than three weeks reading. It, this is a French-Canadian novel, To the Forest, by Anais Barbeau Lavalette, translated by Rhonda Mullins. It's not a long book, it's only about 180 pages, and it's written in vignettes, very poetic, and yet it's not a book that I could rush through. The story is about two families, so four adults, five children, at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, they escape Montreal and go and live in a hundred year old ramshackle house in the forest which is where the narrator grew up. Uh, not too far away is the house where her parents live, so grandparents of some of the children that are there. And at this house there's no phone reception, no, uh, no internet, um, by the time the second stage of the state of emergency takes uh, effect, when the schools switch over to online learning, the kids, in order to get internet reception and, and access their classes, they have to get close to the road, so under the big oak tree by the road is where they have their classes. Before that, the four adults took turns. Um, each one took an afternoon, and it was a lot of uh, time spent in nature learning stuff. So there's lots and lots of nature writing, and it also tied in with books that I was reading concurrently. You might remember that I recently read Elena Regan's memoir, Fieldwork, in which she and her wife go and live in the forest, and it's during the pandemic. Elena talks about her childhood memories of mushroom hunting with her father, and in this book, the author is following her father and her child mushroom hunting for chant chanterelles. There's another, there's a scene in Fieldwork where Elena's father comes up with a method for cracking black walnut shells, which is to spread them out on the driveway and then drive back and forth over them with the car, and they end up 
going off like gunshots and pieces of walnut shell break windows which then because they don't have a lot of money they end up taping plastic over and in this book in this ramshackle house they've got plastic taped over the windows and actually in big swiss as well uh, the the main character is uh, the transcriber Greta. She's living in a house where they have plastic taped over the windows. She's living in a house where there's lots of insects, including uh, a hive of bees, actually. Uh, and in here we have not only lots of insects in the house, but garter snakes and mice and squirrels. And you might remember if you've been watching my channel that I included some garter snake footage and I have been reading this book at the same time so you know lots of connections she writes about the cute things that kids say so for example uh, when her son Noe lost a tooth uh, he left a note under his pillow uh, something like dear tooth fairy I'm not interested in money. Wow me. And her youngest, who's five years old, she sees her pulling a leech off her thigh after they've been swimming and some leeches are stuck to her. And she says to the leech, do you love me? Cute stuff like that. There's a scene I liked where the narrator encounters a beaver when she is swimming in the river and they're just staring at each other face to face and she writes, he is in my bubble, clearly, and I am in his. Neither of us yields. So that kind of COVID terminology when we had bubbles, you know, it's um, incorporated into a very poetic memoir. The English translation just came out this year and in French it came out last year. It has this earthy groundedness so uh, what I mean by that is so she is describing how they hung up sweet clover in the bathroom to dry and so the fragrance of the sweet clover mixes with the scent of a child's poo floating in the toilet. You know, that, that kind of thing. Here's a, a sample of her writing. The large birch at the edge of the woods is dying in the cold. It pitches, dry, eviscerated, bare. I am like the tree, made of the same atoms of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. My genes, structured in a DNA double helix, have the same architecture and workings as its genes. And I am the fruit of the same event, the appearance of life on Earth billions of years ago. It bends, it's going to break. But underground, its strong, full roots, thirsty and brave, hold it upright, and it recovers stretching into the night, scathed but standing. They go through lots of experiences of death, but there's also a lot of reassurance of being so connected to nature. I crossed the pine forest of my childhood. Half my life took shape between these towering trees the tips of the pine needles create an invisible rain, a cloud of molecules, negative ions. Science has shown their incredible power. Negative ions make you happy. There's a couple places where I took issue with the translation, and this was one of them, where the narrator sets off into the forest with her five ninjas, five children, and they are going to collect pine branches. Today's class, learning what they are. So that's how it's written, pine branches. And when they return home with them, they've got a field guide where they figure out what trees they are. 
She's saying what kind of pines they are, but in fact, what they are is conifers because they've got black spruce and hemlock and balsam fir and cedar and red pine and white pine. So the collective term for these kinds of trees is not pines, it's conifers. So one little mistake there. That's kind of nitpicky. This The writing is beautiful. There isn't a whole lot as far as plot goes. Basically it's day-to-day -day life, reconnecting with nature, and uh, it's quite lovely. And that is all I've got for you today. Thank you my friends. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you will say hello in the comments below. Tell me what's going on with you. What you're reading. Have you read any of these? Do you want to read any of these? And I'll see you all very soon in the next Friday Reads. Bye for now.